prepare ourselves as we listen to the message this morning. A church of truth and love, truth in church lives based on 2 John 1 to 4. I now give you Pastor Noel Espinosa. Over the past days and week, we have seen how helpless we still are uh, against the forces of nature. Typhoons have battered our country, one of them in the category of super typhoon, and in their trail, they left a path of destruction, not only of property, but also of human lives, fatalities, ruined livelihoods, that we are still helpless uh, to forces of nature. Perhaps science will one day find a way to weaken a typhoon, or at least minimize its damage, but we are not yet in that day. But when you think of the church, and I'm thinking of the universal church, it has endured more forces than just that of nature. It has faced the worst of opposition, the worst persecution there has been in history, and count also the infernal forces of the devil arrayed against the church. And yet that church is still here after more than 2,000 years of opposition. This can only be a fulfillment of the promise of Christ in Matthew 16, 18, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what has that, this got to do with the local church? Well, every local church that is faithful is a manifestation of the universal church. And therefore, by the grace of God, a faithful church is enabled to endure for as long as that church follows the path of faithfulness. Now, this month of November is our anniversary month. We would have been very busy now preparing for our Thanksgiving celebration. I imagine our choir would have been practicing and let alone preparation and anticipation of the familyhood. Uh, but by providence, we cannot do those things. We are in a pandemic. But I still would like to use the four remaining Sundays of this month to help us reflect on this. Uh, something to be thankful for. The occasion of a church anniversary should elicit gratitude. We thank the Lord for preserving us as a church. And with the thankfulness is also the challenge to a growing commitment to what we are called to be as a church. And in this four Sundays, God willing, I will use the second letter of the Apostle John for this series. In terms of number of verses, the second letter of John is the shortest in the New Testament. And yet it is pregnant with meaning and the challenge for what the church ought to be should be enriching to all of us. And as we begin this series, I want us to ask the question, what sets a faithful church apart? Of course, there are many other churches, many of them unfortunately cannot be called faithful. There are many organizations faithful to their own mission statements, but not the mission, of course, that God has given to the church. So we ask the question, what sets a faithful church apart from the others? What should set Grace Baptist Church now in its 39th year apart if it is? and hopefully continue to be a faithful church? Well, the second letter of John will give us some definite answers to that. And I would invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the second letter of John. We will read the introductory verses, verses 1 to 4. Second John, verses 1 to 4. And I read these words. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides or lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. 
As you can see, this letter is addressed to what John calls the elect lady. Now, although there are still some who believe that this is a specific female believer to whom John was writing, the consensus of scholarship is that this is a coded language for a local church at a time that there were already opposition to Christianity. It would help that a letter to a church is coded. And that is also uh, borne out by the fact that when the writer introduced himself, he calls himself the elder. And in the very last verse, he calls his representation to be the children of the elect sister of this elect lady. So that uh, is consistent with the idea that the elect lady is a church to which the writer is writing and the elect sister is another church which is a fellowship church of this church, the, uh, the addressee of this letter. Tradition has identified these three consecutive letters we call 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John as that of the Apostle John. And indeed, there are many similarities when you compare this with the Gospel of John, the same vocabulary and the same thrust. But what impresses you of this second letter of the Apostle John is the constantly repeated two words. And those two words are truth and love. And that tells us already of a characteristic of a faithful church as that which combines the characteristic of holding to the truth and exercising love. Now that is a tall order. We can see a church that is full of love and yet have no commitment to the truth. And on the other extreme, there are churches that are mindful to be orthodox about truth, but it is a loveless church. And if you and I, as Grace Baptist Church, will be, can continue to be a faithful church, we better put these two in balance and in combination in our church. We must be a church of truth and love. Now, the first four verses reveal the relationship of the truth to the church. What makes it a faithful church insofar as the truth is concerned. I have a simple message for you this morning. And that simple message is that a faithful church has the truth of Christ defining its life. Ang matapat na iglesia ay pinagkikilanlan ng katotohanan ni Kristo. A faithful church has the truth of Christ defining its life. The very message is simply put, but I hope it will be enriching to our understanding it will make us appreciate more what the church is you see every agency every business every organization has to have something to define it to distinguish it from others some are defined by their products others are defined by the fame of their leaders and still others defined by their constitution the uh, the, the membership of the church, none of what I said is defining of a faithful church. John's language here is very significant, even profound. He says, the truth that abides or that lives or that dwells in us, in the church. And in his first commendation of the membership of the church, he says, your children are walking in the truth. So you have here two complementary descriptions that should fit a faithful church. They are like flip sides of the same coin. And I hope these two descriptions fit Grace Baptist Church as we are remembering God's goodness in our 39th anniversary. Those two descriptions are first, the truth of Christ lives in a faithful church. Ang katotohanan ni Kristo ay nananahan sa isang matapat na iglesia. The truth of Christ lives in a faithful church. And secondly, a faithful church lives by the truth of Christ. Ang matapat na iglesia ay namumuhay sa katotohanan ni Kristo. A faithful church lives 
by the truth of Christ. Now, they sound similar, but I will show that they are referring to two different issues, though inseparable. The first is that the truth of Christ lives in a faithful church. The verb used by John to describe the relationship of the truth to the church is that the truth abides, the truth lives, or you can say the truth dwells. Now, that is a surprising description because what we might expect of the church in rela relation to the truth is when we say the truth or the, the church confesses the truth or the church is faithful to the truth. Now, that is true, but John is saying something so much more profound than that. John begins with what the truth is to the church, not what the church is doing to the truth. He'll say something about that in a while, but it is first what the truth is doing to the church and the church or the truth is dwelling, the truth is abiding in the church. And if that is how John describes the faithfulness of the church, he calls the elect lady. I hope it is a fitting description of Grace Baptist Church as well. The truth of Christ dwelling in the church defines its faithfulness. Ang katotohanan ni Kristo na nananahan sa iglesia ang nagpapakilala sa kanyang katapatan. How do we identify a faithful church? We regularly identify a house by the dwellers in that house. We say, well, in that house of my neighborhood, uh, such family lives and in that uh, an officer of the barangay lives, we tend to identify a house by the dwellers of the house. But as far as the church is concerned, the dweller is not so much in the identity of the people who are members of the church, but rather the truth that becomes the indwelling presence in the church. It is the animating force in the church. What makes it the church that is faithful is because the truth is defining it. That is something that we need to examine in ourselves as a church. Now later, John will warn against false prophets who are going around churches to seek their support. And what makes them false is that they hold and teach a false teaching concerning Christ. They, in other words, they are teaching a false Christ. And for a faithful church, the very basic minimum is that they have a true Christ. But more than that, Christ is true to them. Uh, again, sounding similar, but really different things. And I will explain. It is possible for us to have an orthodox truth about Christ. In other words, in the language of theology, we have an orthodox Christology. Our doctrine of Christ is correct and that is important. Later on, John will argue on the basis of the orthodox doctrine of the incarnation that the false prophets were denying. That is important, but you see, it is possible for a church to hold some truths and still be counted as not being a faithful church. Baptist churches, for example, are committed to the practice of baptism by immersion of believers. And that is a truth. That is a truth that I am committed to, that I will defend, and hopefully I will live by and practice in our church. But that does not necessarily make the church that is committed to baptism of believers by immersion a faithful church. It is not the truth of baptism that makes a church faithful. Again, as a Baptist church, we are committed to the practice of believers baptism by immersion because there is no other meaning of baptism but immersion and for those of you who are believers and yet you are not yet baptized you must realize that that is the first command to a believer not to be a soul winner 
The first command to a believer is to be a church member by baptism. And if you remain unbaptized, that is disobedience right at the very first step. I regard baptism as an important doctrine and I am committed to it. But it is not our being a committed Baptist that makes us a faithful church. Rather, it is the truth of Christ. Yes, it will include doctrines concerning Christ, such as, as I've said, the incarnation which John is going to address in this short letter. And for 39 years, our church has held to the, fruitful, to the truthful teaching concerning Christ. We believe in his deity. We believe in his humanity. We believe in his atoning death. We believe in the cross of Christ. And we believe that that is the only way of salvation. And if for those of you who have been attending our church, either physically before the pandemic, or perhaps you have been attending our church virtually during this pandemic, I urge you to realize that there is no other salvation but what Christ has done, who he is, the God made man, and what he has done, who died on the cross, rose from the dead. And by that, he has satisfied the just wrath of God against sinners. And the only way you can be saved is come to this Christ. And we have held to these doctrines of Christ to have a truthful doctrine and teaching concerning Christ. But again, John is saying so much more than just holding truthful teaching about Christ. He is talking of the truth of Christ, meaning Christ is true to us. Christ is true to the church. And that is what gives it meaning. That is what gives the church identity. It means that Christ is the truth that gives meaning to the life of the church. The fact that Christ is true to us in a personal way. Now, if some other truth is giving our identity and meaning as a church rather than that Christ is true, we may call ourselves Orthodox, Reformed, Baptist, but we may fall short of being called a faithful church if the truth of Christ is not that which dwells. John is speaking of a specific truth, not just any truth, but the truth of Christ. You know, regardless of the outcome of the U.S. presidential elections, and everybody can see it's going Biden's way, but regardless of the outcome, one thing that it will expose is that most media polls have been proven false and fake. They have almost all predicted a landslide victory for Biden, and that is not what is happening. They have predicted landslide victory for Biden in some states which Trump won. I'm not talking about politics here, but simply the truthfulness or falsehood of those who are supposed to have a mandate of honestly taking the opinions of the American voters. They did not. They pushed for someone's candidacy rather than be true to their mandate. Now, you see, that shows an unfaithful polling. Now, when it comes to the church, we can have some truths we can demonstrate and defend and proclaim and have enough to be called a Reformed Baptist Church. But if the truth of Christ is not that which animates us, we will fall short of that description of a faithful church. Well, thankfully, we have held to the truth of Christ as defining of our church. And that is my challenge to you in this anniversary month. Let us be thankful for the preservation of the truth of Christ in our church because we find Christ to be true in all he is and in all he claims. It changed our world. It changed our lives. We call it conversion. 
And if I'm speaking to anyone who has yet to come to the point of conversion, you may know Christ, you may have heard of Christ, but you have not come to him as one who is true in all he is and in all he claims. And you have not yet bowed down to him as Lord and Savior. Come to him now. Don't let Christ be just a doctrine and name to you, but rather let him be true to you as Lord and Savior. And when we were converted, we joined with others who also had their world and lives changed by the truth of Christ. Now it will be a sad day if we retain some truths enough to be called a church, but we fail to retain the truth of Christ. This is sadly happening in many churches. They are being defined by claims of blessings and happiness. They may invoke the name of Christ for what they claim, but it is not the truth of Christ that has radically changed them and defines the life and meaning of their church. And that is the reason why regularly they have to invent incitements in order to make people come and stay and happy. Because the truth of Christ is not what animates, it is not what dwells, it is not what lives in the church. But for us, there is nothing better in being a church than that what identifies us is that Christ is true. When Paul contrasted the Ephesian believers from pagans and their past unbelief, this is the language he used in Ephesians 4, 20 and 21. Listen, but that is not the way you learn Christ. That is the pagan's immorality. That is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So what set apart these former pagans themselves? Now they are Christians. It's not because they found some blessings that will make their lives convenient and prosperous and perhaps some promise of health and wealth. No, they saw Christ and Christ became true to them and the truth of Christ changed their world, their lives. And they became Christians and joined together in order to form the Ephesian church. That is what a faithful church is. The truth of Christ lives in it. So we can set in contrast a faithful church from a church that still has some truths, but not faithful. As in the case of the elect lady that John addresses, the truth abides in a faithful church, but not just any truth, but the truth of Christ. It is possible to begin with the truth of Christ defining a church, but later on be defined by something else. John Bunyan pastored the church in Bedford, England in the year 1672. The church is still there, but it is presently called Bunyan Meeting House. Well, probably they have their reason to immediately get fame by being called Banyan Meeting House. But I think by doing that, John Banyan is turning in his grave. He would not want his church to be defined by his fame. The church must be defined by what Christ is, by what he has done, and the truth of Christ to the church. So this is one characterization of a faithful church the truth of christ lives in a faithful church but there is a second thing a faithful church lives by the truth of christ now this is not just another way of saying what i said in my first point this is based on what john does in commending the church and the members when he says in verse 4 your children are walking in the truth. Now you see, if the elect lady is a church and is the mother, the children definitely refers to members 
of the church. So you have the church as a whole and then the membership in particular. So from the elect lady as John's identification of the whole church, he now turns his eye on the members themselves. And what he can commend of the members is that they themselves are walking in the truth. Not only is the church defined by the indwelling truth of Christ, but the members live by the truth of Christ. Well, that tells us of a faithful church where the conduct of the members is governed by the truth of Christ. Ang pamumuhay ng mga miyembro ng isang tapat na iglesia ay pinamamahalaan ng katotohanan ni Kristo. Now, we believe in covenant church membership. You become a member voluntarily, yes, but once a member, you are a member covenantally. That is, by covenant, by commitment. The church as a whole may be faithful in being defined by her identity, by the truth of Christ, but that, re that requires of individual members to so conduct themselves that they may be able to demonstrate that this is true of their lives as well. It will not happen perfectly in any church, not even in the apostolic churches of the New Testament. That's why there is provision of rebuke, of admonition, even of censures. But just as the truth of Christ is defining of the identity of the church, so every member must seek to be so. Again, as I said of the church as a whole, it is possible for a member to become so enamored with a particular truth that is good by itself, but not the truth of Christ. It may not be the truth of Christ that is moving and compelling his life as a believer. But when the Apostle Paul defined his life in its most succinct way, what did he say in Philippians 1.21? For to me to live is Christ. Christ defines it all. He's committed to doctrine, but it's not doctrine. He's committed to the practices of the church in terms of their sacraments, but he is, it is not those that define his Christian life. To me, to live is Christ. There are some who are driven by their good fellowship with members, and that is good. We will come to the concept of love as another of the pillars that define a faithful church. But sometimes the truth that drives them to go on in their church life is that they have their friends. They have fun. They've got company. I will not be one to hinder cultivation of good fellowship in the church, especially as that fellowship is defined by Christian love. But it is fair to ask, how much is your life as a member driven by the truth of Christ? In other words, your life is driven by the fact that Christ is true to you. Not just that the Bible is true, of course it is. I'm teaching now bibliology or the doctrine of the Bible and I spend so much time explaining to my students and defending the truth of the Bible. But if the truth of the Bible is the only thing that moves you and compels you to live, something is inadequate. It must be the truth of Christ, that Christ is true. Apostle Paul puts it in a very sharp fashion when he said in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 22, if anyone has no love for the Lord, he doesn't say he'll lose some reward. It says, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. And then he attaches the prayer, our Lord, come. The yearning for Christ 
and it is a fair question to ask, is Christ becoming more true to you as you go on in your Christian life? We say that a child growing up discovers that Santa Claus is not true, but just a pigment of human tradition. It is the opposite in Christian growth. As the Christian grows more and more, Christ becomes true to him more and more. And that is the question to ask ourselves as members of the church. My challenge to the members, to all of us, let us grow in knowledge of and submission to the truth of Christ in our daily life. Let him be true to you. We have our gathering regularly twice a week, virtual now in most cases, and we treasure those moments. But for most of the week, you are on your own. Now, let me explain. You do not cease to be a member when you are on your own. But it is a challenge that once you are away from the gathered church, is it the truth of Christ driving you? That is what we have maintained as a church. And that should be what you should maintain as an individual member when you are away from the gathered church. And this pandemic, you usually are by yourself away from the gathered church. And the question is, without the gathered church, is there that truth of Christ that compels you, that impels your living, your Christian life? Are you growing in the knowledge of Christ? Of course, that includes knowing more of the doctrines concerning Christ, but it means more. We talk of growing in knowledge of a person when you know him personally. You get to know what he likes, what he does not like. You know the things that provoke him. You know the things that make him happy. And that is the exhortation to know Christ. In 2 Peter 3.18, grow in the knowledge of grace and of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you are growing in your truth of Christ in your life, more and more of his lordship will be true to you. You will know what would please him. You will know what would displease him. That's growing in the knowledge of Christ, making his lordship dominant in your life. And you can talk of what Christ as a truth is doing to your life. Not just what his name means, how precious his name is, or how dear the doctrines of Christology are. But Christ. It is well known that one of the first martyrs after the New Testament was Polycarp. And it's also well known that encounter between the proconsul urging him to recant. After all, he was very old. And his answer, for me, the most poignant line was when he said, this 86 years, Christ has done me no wrong. Why should I recant? Why should I deny him? That's the language of a man who knows Christ as true to him. He's not talking there of Orthodox Christology, which is important. He is not talking there of having the name Christ that explains why he is a Christian. He's talking here of what Christ is to him. But Christ has done him no wrong. <coughs> and that is something that we need to challenge to ourselves. How true is Christ to you? Because that will define your faithfulness as a member of the church. And may it be true to us. The best commendation for a church is that the truth of Christ defines it and the members of the church live by the truth of Christ. And that means let us seek 
to know more of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In response, we will sing the hymn, More about Jesus would I know, More of His grace to others show, More of His saving fullness see, More of His love who died for me. And may not be the real petition of our hearts, both as a church, corporately, and as members individually, that there may be more of Christ to us, the truth of Christ that lives in the church.